Hello, this is Pastor Jay. I'm excited to invite you to come over to listen to our broadcast on YouTube. Yes, Walk in True Christian Fellowship Church on YouTube. We have some great videos over there and you'll be able to listen to all the lessons and the podcast. So again, subscribe, like, and continue to comment and listen. This is Pastor Jay. Talk to you later. Peace. God bless you and welcome to Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast. We appreciate and welcome all of you, our listeners around the world. Stay tuned to hear an exciting word from pastor teacher, Dr. James Sutton. Since we're talking about sanctification, we're in chapter 6, and uh, we've covered the fall of man, that man cannot redeem himself, that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've covered the fact that you're saved by grace and faith alone, and we understand that salvation is simply a sovereign God acting independently on a sin-sick soul in the time that he chooses. There's nothing that the human brings to the table other than his wretchedness. And when God decides to save someone, there's nothing that they can do to stop it. Everybody at an appointed time that calls himself a Christian got saved. Okay? Sometimes we often confuse our salvation with sanctification. Salvation, all God, nobody else. He saved you, then you believed. You didn't believe, and then he saved you. I mean, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that, but the Bible tells us in Ephesians that we were dead, and a dead person doesn't know anything, and it says the dead person can't have a relationship with God. So he had to act sovereignly, and regenerate you, you hear the words like regenerate, you hear the word like quicken. He had to make you alive. And when God decides to move, it's just like when he breathed into Adam. He breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Adam didn't bring anything to the table. Adam was there and God wanted to make him alive. And God wants to save people. Now, what I know most people get caught up in is that, well, there are some people that won't be saved. Well, that's true. And it's not because necessarily God doesn't want them saved. They have been created for the glory of God in their disobedience. They're still going to be held responsible because ultimately, since we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, they've rejected God's opportunity for salvation. So many times in life, I look back And I could see God's hand in my life where I had a chance to be saved or I had a chance to receive him. And I lied, simply lied. I just want to get out the circumstance I was in. I was really not trying to pursue God. I was just trying to get out of the pain of what decisions I made. So I'd say, you know, at that point, I'd say anything. You know, there was a point when when I was about to leave what I knew that I was like, God, if you just get me out of this one. And I thought about it. How many times I said that in life? How many times have you guys said, God, if you just get me out of this circumstance, I am going to, and I don't know how fast it happened, but I know it don't don't take long before I just either go back to what I was doing, or I just end up uh, uh, drifting away as if he didn't get me out of it at my request. And that's the goodness of God. So God sovereignly saves us. And now, uh, in chapter 6, we're going into the sanctification process. That process which begins from the day you're saved until the day you go into glory. There's nobody that gets saved and necessarily goes on to glory. We see that in the sense of the thief on the cross, but the normative way is you get saved, there's a process of sanctification, and you're guaranteed glorification. All those who are being sanctified by God will one day be glorified by God. Amen. Would you just say that's from the end? Being saved to the end? Okay. Sanctification begins at the moment of salvation, which is the journey from that day, that moment, to the time you close your eyes, which is glorification. You will not be glorified on this side. You get glorification on the other side, okay? 
So you're working towards that. The normative process is salvation, sanctification, glorification. In, in, in salvation, you are justified. You are made right, declared by God to be right. Now, are you actually right? No. Because you're going, you have to live out being right in your sanctification process. And that's the process we participate in. And it's simple and it's beautiful because the more you're obedient to the process as you learn the process, the more that you can actually, what, we, what you might say, have the experience with God that he wants you to have with them. If you're disobedient in the sanctification process, you're not going to have the experiences that you want to have or that you claim that you want to have. So everything wraps around now. How well are you willing to walk with God as you learn of God and obey God in heading towards your glorification? We are all at different points <coughs> in this room. We are not at the same point. Same page, you know, you're about unification, you're being unified. It has nothing to do with sanctification. We're unified in sanctification because we all are being sanctifi sanctified by the same person, but we're all at different stages of our sanctification. And, and to say one is further than the other, all I can say is that's determined by when you're going to die. Because let's say for some, God, God forbid, tomorrow I'm going to wake up. Guess what? I'm closer to glorification than you are. Because I'm going to die. So it's not being better or worse or farther along. Thank God that every day, the longer you're here, the longer you get to, to experience him in the process. And it's during that process to which you, which you court other people to become saints, to become children of God by the way you live your life. Sanctification is simply the journey of your life after you save. Sanctification is the journey of life after you save. God sees you complete because... You're, you, he doesn't, he's not governed by linear time. Everything in God is now. There is no such thing as past. Everything in God, there's no such thing as future. Everything in God is now. 100 years, it's now. So God says, you're his workmanship. He's going to complete you. He already sees you complete. But you have to walk it out. And the beauty of it for us as Christians, and especially as leadership, leaders and, and saints of God, don't get so bogged down in where a person's at their sanctification. If you trust God, you trust that he's the workman, he's the potter, he'll fix that person. But a lot of times what we do is because we didn't got a little knowledge and a little, we think we're a little spiritual, we hold to the key to their sanctification. We don't hold the key to their sanctification. Just like in salvation, he's the key. In sanctification, the relationship between them and God. Your job is to encourage them, instruct them, and correct them if you have a knowledge that you've applied to yourself first. Uh -huh. You need to apply it to yourself first. You ain't fit. You can't tell me how to be victorious over something you're still struggling with. Now, you can come along and tell me the truth and say we can both struggle together and figure this thing out together, but don't pretend like you're victorious over something and then you get caught. And then somebody like, well, I thought you telling me, you know, and then don't be like we was talking about with Sister Frida. So much of us do this. When you get caught, I'm still a work in progress. And all that does is allow you to continue to sing. Right. We've already covered. Shall we continue in sin that grace shall abound? God forbid. Those who have, have surrendered themselves to God have no works of the flesh in sin. We don't go there no more. If we're dead to it, we're dead to it. If you're alive to it, you're alive to it. So we talked about slaves. So we're going to pick up where we left off at, talk about slaves at chapter 6 at verse, I want to start at 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. Say it loud and proud. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, mm -hmm. but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Mm -hmm. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Stop. So, present yourselves. Who's presenting who? Who's presenting what? Is it you or God presenting? Who is it? What did you say? Read it. You present yourself. This ain't no trick question. It's right there in front of you. You present yourself, so that means it's your what? Your choice. Your choice. Your choice. Ain't pastor's choice. 
It ain't the body's choice. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. He's telling you what to do. Present yourselves what? To God. To God as instruments of what? Righteousness. So in other words, don't present yourself to God as a flute and you running around playing like a tuba. Okay? You can't fool God. You know, don't be walking around like you a scalpel and you a hammer. God says present yourself to righteousness. So the sanctification process, the first part we have to understand, it's about presenting ourselves to God for righteousness. So that's what we're going to learn. What does that mean? What does presenting ourselves, I mean, we said, we just said it's easy, present ourselves for righteousness. Okay, what does that actually mean to present ourselves? What do you guys think? What, does, what do you think? Just off the top of your head before we get into it. What do you think that means? Surrender. Surrender? Good. What else? It could mean a whole bunch of things. There's not going to be a wrong answer for real. So just think about it and tell me what you think. Look better. Presentation. What you mean? Explain, explain that for me. More pleasing to the senses of him. You look better, smell better, do better. Mm -hmm. I meant look though. Look better. Present. Yeah. When you say look better, is it a physical thing? Being obedient. Being obedient. To his word. Mm -hmm. To his word. So for you said look better, what do you mean by that? So people is, people can see. It. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, look, he's not really looking, but you want to look to other people mm -hmm. like he can see him. Yeah, representable. Yeah. Okay. And what does that look like? I'm going to keep asking questions so you can define it for me. What is it like looking, you're making yourself presentable? What does presentable look like? She said it, being obedient to the word. Your actions, your character. Does it make a difference how you dress? Yes, it does. Okay, we got yes and we got no. Okay, so that's good. Let's talk about that just briefly. When you say yes, what do you mean? Because you both can be right. Okay. It just depends on where you're coming from. Okay. Okay, when you say yes, it does, where are you coming from? I mean, as far as... Your outer appearance with you that when you're saying there are certain ways that you should dress to provoke or draw attention to yourself. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you should dress modestly and not lewdly because if you dress lewdly in any fashion, you're presenting yourself not unto righteousness. Right? Am I hearing that? Is that is that a good that, synopsis? That could be a, a deflective to others, you know. Mm -hmm. And then too, I believe that when you dress modestly. Mm -hmm. That you are representing God, and some mm -hmm. some play, some ways that you dress, it seems like you're more worldly. You might not okay. be, but it seems more worldly okay. than godly. Okay, so we have a worldly way of dressing and a godly way of dressing. To me, to you. Okay, mm -hmm. now in the sanctification process, let me ask you something. So, if I can dress godly or worldly, does it necessarily mean if I dress worldly, I'm not saved? No, it doesn't. What in your eyes? What would that mean? If I'm still dressing rurally, but I claim to claim, I claim to know Christ, what is the issue? That means that you need need to be transformed. God needs to transform you into the image that He wants you to be in. So then, as a saint of God, I need to get that person time. Right. Now we over to you. You said no. Where are you coming from? And I'm saying you both right. I'm just saying where you coming from. Where you coming from? That you that you can dress. You just not a, it's not based upon how you dress. I just kind of gave you the answer then, but go ahead. <laughs> Linda, you oh, said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Linda, you said that. Yeah. You said no. Go ahead. I'm not saying you're right. Go ahead. Give me where you're coming from. Well, in the prospect of me, you know, saying what, thinking the way I feel. Yeah. It's just like, uh, an example, like on your job. Mm -hmm. Same way. I feel that you, well, you supposed to dress a certain way mm -hmm. on going to work or a certain place you go into, just like when you're going out to a club, you mm -hmm. dress a certain way. The ones who... So I just feel that, but it doesn't mean that you're not saved. Uh -huh. you, you know, so, I feel that, so, but so you're talking from a salvation point of view. You see what I'm saying, which is true. She's talking from a sanctification point of view after you say. You follow me? Both of you are right. To get saved, you come as you are. Mm -hmm. And you come, and let me tell you, it's not as you dress, you come as a sinner. That, that's mm -hmm. what I agree. And sinners are dressed however they dress. Because yeah, right. we can have sinners in a three-piece suit. Yeah. Right. But once you get saved and understand presenting yourself as instruments of righteousness, there's a dress that you should know that I am not distracting people from the God that's in me right. with my physicality. 
I've watched it in this body where certain people four years ago, they would get up here and things would be all over the place. Yeah, I'm serious. And then now, you can barely see their neck. And, I, and that's fine. Because it's not a distraction. We should never dress in a way that hinders someone from seeing God when we come to the sanctuary. Now, when you get out there and you represent God your own way, God already knows. So I don't even worry about that. Because I don't expect to catch none of y'all out there like that. I really don't. I'm, I'm not even worried about that. That's the least of my concerns. But both of you are approaching it just different time frames. You're approaching it from the uh, sanctification process. You're approaching it pre-salvation salvation point. Both of them are right, okay? I want y'all to get that. That's why we got to know the difference when we talk about sanctification or salvation. Which one are we really talking about? So it tells us to present ourselves as instruments to be used. God uses us. Right? Uh, somebody go to Ephesians uh, 2 and 9. And we're going to see about us being used as instruments. And 2 and 9 and 2 and 10. Ephesians. 9 is in the middle of the sentence. Okay, go 7 or 8. Uh, I'll do 8. Okay, 2 and 8 to 2 and 10. 2 and 8. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Mm -hmm. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Stop. So we see salvation. By grace through faith that we saved, right? That goes with Romans. He's been saying in Romans. Paul don't change up. That's how you say by grace through faith. The gift from God. Salvation. Okay, now let's keep going. Read. Not a result of works. Okay. So that no one may boast. So you can't bring anything to the table. You didn't save yourself. God saved you. In the right time. And the right time is the time that he saved you. You couldn't have been saved no other time than when he saved you. Okay? You can't say, see this, when we say stuff kind of like, I wish I would have known what I know back then. No, you are right where God wants you to be. Okay? Ain't no sense of you looking back. I said it too. Man, for where I'm looking at myself now, I'm like, wow, if I would have known, no, it wasn't meant for me to know then. Because I, because I had to go through to get to the point where I, when God decided to give me maybe, and I'm telling you this, I believe one more shot, I was able to see him. Because he let that demon sit on my bedpost. Because that demon couldn't have been there unless God let him be there. And just like God let him be there and choking the heck out of me, he let me come out of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I don't never want to see that again. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and read. For we are his workmanship. Now sanctification. For we are whose workmanship? His, his workmanship. Go ahead. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So, so the point of our sanctification during our process is to do what? Good works. Good works. Good works. So there is the process of being saved, the process of being saved through sanctification, and while you're going through the process from salvation to glory, sanctification, you, your purpose is to do what? Good works. And if you're not doing good works, we got to backtrack and ask the question. Are you saved? See, all questions, if we go backwards, leads to the point where we're not following the script. Are you really that which you claim and you don't have any good works? About a question. Go ahead. What happens when people cause themselves doing good works? They're just working, but they're not. They're not truly saved. Well, see, th there lies the issue. Because saved folk and unsaved folk can do the same work, and one doing it for God and one doing it for self. And they look the same. And the person who's unsaved may claim a false humility in doing it for Christ, but they're not saved. And that's really only what God knows. See, we don't worry about who's saved or not saved. We'll take a person at their word until we see different, different which means we'll see their good works, which are their fruit. What did they cultivate out of being saved? You're going to cultivate good works if you're saved. And if you're not saved, you're going to have thorns and thistles. And that brings about another question. Mm -hmm. There are religious people. Mm-hmm. But they're still lost. Yes. Religion 
is the biggest tool that the devil uses to trick you. Because religion, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I'll, be, I'll be talking about this in my podcast this week, about church abuse. Religion you leads normally to somebody, no, religion leads to cultism. Cultism is a form of abuse. And what religion does is tell you that there's normally a person or persons who those who follow the religion look to, count on as their relationship with God. Religion says, you need me before you can go to him. Religion says you got to stand a certain way to be acceptable in God's sight. Religion says that you got to wear white gloves before you do anything. Religion says you have church clothes. Religion says that you got to have a, a gold plate to put your offering in. Religion says don't leave on vacation before you leave your what? Tithes. Your tithes right. and your offering. Mm -hmm. And it gets more abusive as you get close into religion. And the people who are practicing religion don't really know that God is not filling them. Don't really know that God is not respecting what they call themselves doing. That they're offering up, as the Bible said, dead works. They don't know that because what they'll do is concentrate on the performance versus the relationship and the holiness of God. And you'll find out they know how to come in and do church. But look at their lives outside of church. They'll know all the catchphrases but can never explain scripture. We the head, not the tail. We anointed, we appointed. All that, all that goofy stuff that we say. And that don't mean nothing to God. Long, lofty, drawn out prayers. Repetitiveness. And the Bible warns us of that. And we still do it because it's easier to be religious than to get in his word and study his word. Part of, part of finding a good body, a church, in your sanctification process is one that teaches the word. You've got to have time teaching the word. If you want to do topical stuff, that needs to be a whole other Bible study. If you want to talk about love and do the topics of love, that needs to be separate. But line by line, verse by verse, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that's how you raise up saints. And that's when you know the difference. Because what the word tells me is what the law told him. That without the Holy Spirit and me yielding to it, I can't perform good at all. But you are made for good works. How do you do good works? First thing you got to do is admit that you can't do it on your own and that you need God. Mm -hmm. yes. And God alone will determine how good it is to on the heart that's doing it. Any ritual that we do in church, walk in truth has a ritual. We have a religion. But, but as your leader, I often tell you, whatever we do is only as good as the heart that's performing it. So we start our service the same way. But nobody in here that's part of our, our congregation will have a conniption if I don't play, we come this far by faith. Yeah, right. Then I'll be sitting there going, we, God will be mad at us because we didn't play, we come this far by faith. No. Or if I preach and don't sing at all. See, because religion sets up these standards of do this, do that, do this, do that. And the people get used to that and they don't become closer to God because they think, I'm doing what the leader says, but the, what the leader is doing is seeing how well you obey them. So that's a ritual. That's a ritual. That's but the ritual is fine as long as it doesn't take place where you're saying it's more important than the word of God. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that we do in, in Walk in Truth is the word of God. Period. All the other stuff is secondary. Because God is not going to ask any of us how well did we participate in the nursing home per se. Good. But that don't save us. That's part of the good works of our sanctification that we want to do that. But we could be doing that under the wrong spirit. See, I'm not trying to let God. See, God says if you want your reward from man, you can get it. And you already have it. Why are you here? But, but why take the lesser when you end up with the greater? Okay? So we are his workmanship. We are his instruments to be used as he chooses. And he chooses to use his saints of God for good works. Okay? Let's go back to Romans. What verse we are? 15. 15. Go ahead. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Mm -hmm. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Now, mm -hmm. if you present yourselves, now it goes from the instruments to now your whole self, right? 
So if you present yourself, which has the instruments, your, your limbs, your thoughts, if you present yourself as obedient slaves, the fact that you're obedient, you're obedient to the master that you enslaved to. Now, once we were sold under sin, once we were followers of the prince of the power of the air, once we were dead in our trespass, once we followed the devil himself, this is who we follow. Whether wanting or unwanting, knowing or unknowing, born in sin and shaped in iniquity, you had no choice. But now that you say you have a choice, and he's saying you can't serve two masters. Either you love the one and hate the other, or you hate the one and love the other. You can't straddle the fence. See, when you meet Jesus and are called out, the ecclesia, the called out ones, you have choices to make. Because we just read it. The first choice is you can present yourself as an instrument to righteousness or an instrument to, 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 to unrighteousness. That's your choice. But now he's going even deeper. Yourselves. So it's just not about your, your, your members. It's about who you are. Don't you know that whoever you present yourself to, a slave to, and obedient to, that's going to be your master. You got a choice. Go ahead. Either of sin, which leads to death. Okay, now, your members presented in unrighteousness leads is sin, and it leads to what? Death. It leads to the wages. What you do with your arms, your body, your mind, is you're, you're working. And whoever you're working for, that's what you get paid with. So if you're working for un in unrighteousness, your wage is a sin, and sin leads to the final wage of what? Death. Death. Complete separation from God spiritually. Now, question. you mentioned something about, and I hear mm -hmm. this quite often, and I'm quite understood too, about sitting on the fence. And the fence. Is it either on one side or the other side? Yeah. Or how does this fence thing come in? Yeah, because... because because what we want to believe in our imagination is that there's actually a fence to sit on. And there's not. Either you're for me or against me. We may, see how we make up stuff. We'll make up the strata of the fence because we're comfortable playing both sides of the fence based upon how well it benefits me. And if I'm playing with God on how well it benefits me, I'm not really with God. I'm with God as long as I get what I want. Okay, so when God decides to bless me, even though I'm standing the fence, supposedly where there is no fence, I'm willing to walk with God. But really, I ain't walking with God. I'm walking with the devil because the devil has tricked me to believe that God is my genie. His whole purpose is to make me feel good. God is the kind of God He loves you so much. He just want to tell you the truth, and oftentimes the truth hurts. Well, it does. Really okay, bad. so we don't have a fence to straddle. Either you form or against you, you with him or you not. You can't. You there is no fence. Man made the fence so we can make an excuse. And in Romans one, it tells us, man, if you out with you are without what excuse. Jesus. Okay, and your problem is you wanted to worship the creation more than the Creator Himself, which is God. And that's our issue. Our issues. We love us. Self esteem, self promotion, self, self, self. Now, there's a word that, that's used now and I, I've never heard it so much as, I, as I've seen it in action and that's the word narcissist yeah. narcissism love of oneself love of oneself and man loves himself and everything revolves around it man centered theology man's determination on how he wants to relate to God versus God's telling us how his creation should relate to him Religion is that creation. Well-intentioned men, some of them, come together and figure that they have a knowledge that nobody else can have, and they form religion. And then people say, okay, man-centered religion, it gets, that's easy. I could do what they do, so the religion grows and grows and grows and grows. And then what happens, as time goes on, as centuries pass, you have this major the denominational religion, and it has God's word in it, but if you follow it carefully, you'll find out is there are some men or men or women that are centered in authority and really you need to please them. You don't need to please God because they will tell you if you please me, then you please in God, which is a lie, which is a lie. Yeah. It's not saying that you don't respect your leaders, but there's no way I can sit here and tell you that you pleasing God is, is solely based upon you making me happy. You know, how can you? 
got to be really blind mm -hmm. to think that you can be greater than the one who created you. Well, we are really blind. We're dead. But dead people don't, are blind. You know, they're not alive and blind. They're dead and blind. Okay? Go ahead and read. Or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Or obedience, which we're going to be slaves to. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness stop in the sanctification process there's a teaching that you need to be committed to it says thanks be to God that you have Basically, stayed focused on the on what you have been taught. He, now think about it. Paul is writing to a church he did not find. He not he not he did not he did not start the church in Rome. He started Ephesus. He started Corinth. He started Colossae. But he did not start the church in Rome. So he's writing them saying, "Thanks be to God that you who have been taught are holding on to what you've been taught, and that helps you become instruments of righteousness or focused on God." So many times. You think you can get it on your own. No, that's not true. And I know when you read the scripture, it's talking about the, uh, the, you, the, you won't need no man to teach you. Okay. And really in that distance, what he's talking to is the Jews. He can't be talking to the Gentiles because you didn't have the scriptures. He's talking to the Jews. The Jews should know. And when he said it's written on tablets, who do you think he's talking to? He ain't talking to no Gentiles. When it was written on tablets? To the Jews. And in this dispensation, when they all come into the body, he says, I'm going to do for them right on their hearts. It's already written on your hearts, but you have to be taught. You know what I'm getting? He said, you're committed to the teaching. That there lies the problem. Religion makes you committed to the man and not the teaching. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the cornerstone and the apostles' doctrine is the foundation. And it tells us that no man can lay this foundation other than what the apostles laid. If you're not following the script of the apostles, you're not teaching. You just have, you, you, you're doing everything else but teaching. A show, a routine, a comedy act, a sad act, whatever, soap opera. You're doing something, but you're not filling the people with the knowledge. Again, the, the one statement that's true throughout the Bible, the people of God, whether they're Gentile, Jew, or Greek, Perish from the lack of knowledge, and the knowledge should come from those who, are, who have been, been called to teach. There's a difference between a teacher and a preacher. A preacher doesn't have to necessarily be a good teacher, but the preacher needs to be willing to be taught. Because what he preaches should be from being committed to the lesson. Okay? Should be become. I don't consider myself a great preacher. Not at all. I, don't, I, I marvel at some great preachers. But they ain't saying nothing. I mean, they, they make me, you know, I can sit there go with the, they got a tone, they got a beat, and they know how to do that. They know how to be an orator, but they're not saying nothing. It's more important that you sit here and listen to my boring self, and I try to get you the word of God line by line and verse by verse, than to sit here and try to do something that's melodious that you can tap your toes to and recite after me. You know, you have to, you have to be committed to the teaching, not the preaching. Okay, go ahead. And having verse 18, uh -huh. and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Okay, you've been set free from sin. So my next question is, if you've been set free from sin, what's the problem? If God says, I have set you free, because those who are set free is what? Free. Okay, so if you've been set free, then why aren't you walking in the freedom to which you've been set. Set means I, t I think about it. I've been I was over here, set over here, and now I'm set over here. So freedom is here, and everything everything after I get saved, I'm doing it as a what? Free person. Because I died to sin. God died. I'm living under grace. I'm not in the law. I've been set free from sin, and now I'm gonna live the rest of my life. How? What's the problem? We choose wrong. Good. Yes. We choose wrong. Because before when I was set in sin, I didn't have no choice. But now I've been set free, I got a choice to make because there's a war raging on inside me. 
It's not I that's sin, but it's the sin that dwells within me. So I have to purposely put that sin to death, deal with that sin, and then turn the volume of the Holy Spirit through his word. The only way you're going to turn the volume up on his word because you've lived in sin so long is to study his word. Be in the word. Become the word. Let the word resonate. Meditate on it day and night. That's the only way you're going to be it. Okay? If you think because you're going to join church and you say, no. It's to turn up the volume of the word of God of holiness in your life. Okay? So now I'm free. But I got a choice now. And it's up to me to make the right choice. And when I make the wrong choice, I actually, I'm still free, but it hinders the progress of the Holy Spirit because the Bible says we can quench the Holy Spirit. See, there's a pace the Holy Spirit wants to take you on. But then there's you, you the problem. And it understands. Holy Spirit understands because it's a person that's sent back by Jesus. The Holy Spirit understands that it will guide us into all righteousness, but there's a friction between who I was and who I am. There's a fight between a new creature and the old creature. The dead creature who's trying to hold me into bondage versus the new creature is trying to let me say, you got a choice in walking your freedom. You are accountable and responsible for your freedom. Anytime that you go back to sin, it's your fault. It's not nobody else's. I don't care how attractive that other sinner made you feel. In that thing, or how 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 the ten of y'all get together and say it's all right, girl, guy, it's all right to do that. We all are work in progress. You sure is, and you're just proving that you need a little bit more work. Okay, go ahead. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. So you're limited. See, you can't really speak too lofty because we're limited by the fact that sin and we're in the flesh. So on this, Paul is saying there's a certain level I could talk to you. See, that's why I like to talk to y'all real simple and real straight. All that Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff, that's good for some time. But the, even Paul said, I, I'm going to speak to you plainly. I'm going to speak to you plainly. I don't, want you, I, I don't want you going around talking about Greek and Hebrew words. Why, for what? You don't speak it. You don't speak it. You, you may know some words, but there's nobody out here that's in our circle of influence that we can sit down and have a conversation in Greek and Hebrew. We speak English. Okay, we don't speak Greek and Hebrew. We speak English. So the only way you're going to understand me if I speak English, not if I show how smart I am. Okay? All right? Paul is saying, look, I'm going to speak to you plainly. Go ahead. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and, Stick, go ahead. and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. Stop. So once, that means there was a time pass that you presented yourself to lawlessness. Okay, go ahead. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. See? So now, after salvation, now present yourselves as slaves to what? Righteousness. righteousness. Everybody go with that word righteous again, which leads to or is leading you in sanctification. The process. So the more you submit to, to righteousness, the more you're participating in what? Sanctification. The less you do it, the slower it goes. It's, I tell you what it's like. I have, I have internet, and I have my regular phone uh, service. When I download stuff, if I'm using the internet, the Wi-Fi, it's faster, much faster. Where if I can do a thirty-minute, like this lesson here. If when I go home or do it from here because there's Wi-Fi here, if I go home, I can download this message in like two minutes. But if I turn off the Wi-Fi and do it under the T-Mobile system, it may take 10 minutes. Same message, same amount of data, but under two different systems that it's being submitted to. You follow what I'm saying? One is I'm submitted to something that slows me down. <coughs> the other I'm submitted to what speeds it through. Now, believe it or not, sometimes, because of whatever, using the slow method is better for some things than using the fast method. The key is it's getting submitted and getting to where it needs to be. So the same thing with you. You're not done because you 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 fail to make the right choice. 
It needs to be slowed down anyway so you can make the right choice. God loves you so much. He doesn't, he don't want to put you on a super highway to learn something and then you don't know what you're doing. Right. He wants you to fumble through it, make mistakes, and get back up and start again until eventually the turn light bulb comes on in your head. So sometimes things come fast to you. Some concepts, that's why I'm patient with you guys. Some concepts, and sometimes you guys start living out what the teaching is committed that you committed to before you can articulate it. So on one end, you got it. On the other end, it's running T-Mobile. Amen. One minute is charter high speed. You're living a life. On the other end, you can't really articulate what you're doing. That's fine. I'd rather you live it. Because if you're living it, you're going to eventually be able to articulate it. But you can articulate it and never live it. Okay, go ahead. We're almost done. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So think about when you were sinning, you know, think about that. Think about it. Think about the still simple. When I was over here, I had nothing to do with righteousness. Mm-hmm. I was free. There's two freedoms. Mm-hmm. One in righteousness and one in sin. And when I'm when I was a, when I was a sinner and dead in my sins and trespasses, I was free from all that was righteous. Free. <laughs> free as a bird. Okay, but what happened? Go ahead. But now that you have been set free from, oh, I'm sorry. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? So in other words, while I was living in sin, I was free from righteousness. But now that I'm placed in righteousness, I'll look back at my sin and realize I wasn't producing nothing but death. See, it's only once I come over here can I look back over there and be like, oh, really? Oh, now that now I'm living under grace and I see righteousness and the law, oh my God. You should have killed me a long time ago based upon your standard. But you love me enough that you didn't. You love me enough that you took my you took your my place on that cross. Because the debt had to be paid, but I wasn't right enough to even pay the debt. So you took it for me, and I get imputed righteousness, not righteousness of my own, the free gift, and I spend the rest of my life appreciating, recognizing, living out righteousness through understanding the gift. That's how you that's how you move. Everything goes back to the cross. Everything goes back to the cross. So, so, so whatever you see in me as God, I've understood a little bit more of the cross. You follow me? It's simple, but it's so much. I can live 10,000 10, lives and never unpack the goodness of the cross. There's not one man on the planet or one woman on the planet that's a Bible teacher. If they tell you the truth, there's no way I can teach you everything. That's why I want to move so I can have more classes, so I can teach you as much as I want. There's so much stuff I want to teach you guys, it can't happen on Tuesday and Sunday. Just too much. And it's good stuff. It's stuff that I think you really enjoy. But we got to get to a point where we're placing the point and we can do that. Okay, go ahead. We just go to 21. Go ahead. Um, for the end of those things is death. Yep. Go ahead. But now that you have been set free from sin. Now that you've been set free from sin and you're in the sanctification process, go ahead. And have become slaves of God. Mm-hmm. The fruit you get leads to sanctification. The fruit you get leads to what? Sanctification. The process leads to the process. Go ahead. And its end, uh-huh. eternal life. So at the end of your sanctification process <laughs> is eternal life. Now, what are the fruits of sanctification? Well, love, joy, peace, self-control, kindness. All these things, there is no law for. Because when you exhibit them, there is no law. There is okay, There is no unrighteousness that supersedes the grace and the fruit of the Spirit. So where sin is, grace, grace abounds much more. All that God is is so much in grace that wherever sin and law points out the fact that you are a sinner, grace can come along and take care of all of it because grace gives you an opportunity to make that choice. But you can't make that choice till he made that choice. Dead people don't make choices. Only live people do. So wherever you at in your sanctification process, you know, Go ahead, finish. You were 21 yet? Uh, we 23 is the last one. Okay, go ahead. For the wages of sin is death, mm-hmm. but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that, that, that takes religion all out the picture, don't it? Yeah. 
The eternal life, the gift is in Christ Jesus, not in religion. And there you have the simplicity of the gospel. It's about him loving us, giving us, giving us, giving us. It's not about us doing to get. It's about us getting to show our appreciation. Every time we do a good work, we show our appreciation to God because we get that good work to the glory of God. We don't take credit for it. Even though people, it's not wrong for you, but hey, you did a nice thing. And you ain't always got to be like, give the glory to God. You can say that if you want to. But God knows if you're giving the glory to him or not. Your attitude behind it should be humility. That God will bless you to, to be able to handle some of his major problems with the people. Some of, some of you are set here so you can handle the problems of others. And what Daphne said the other week is true. Be glad that God uses you on the front line in some people's lives because guess what? He chose you. He could have chose anybody but you. But he chose you. And some of you are not fit for that. It's okay. That's why he said we're a body. The hand, the feet, the arms, all of that is important. So we don't lessen that somebody else is not doing what we do. That's why I don't encourage you guys. You don't need to do what I do. You need to figure out what God wants you to do in this body. And there were religion drives too. What religion does is control the gifts of God for man. What faith and grace in a good body of Christ lets that be evident in the body so the body can be edified and grown. I don't need to control your gift, you know, but I do want you to be accountable and responsible for what you do. <coughs> you know, so we'll stop there. We're going to be in chapter seven, right? Yes. Next week. And uh, we just thank God for all those who are listening around the world. Especially all my new frown uh, subscribers and friends. Don't forget that you can check us out on YouTube at Walker Truth Ministries on YouTube. Or you can check us out on Facebook at Walker Truth Christian Fellowship Facebook. Again, thank you guys for listening and be blessed. Hello, this is Pastor Jay with Walker Truth Radio Podcast. And I want to invite all those within the St. Louis metropolitan area and around the world to come worship with us every Sunday at 8 a.m at the Universal Church of Jesus Christ building, located at 2301 Wallace Avenue, Overland, Missouri, 63114. We also have our Rescue Addiction Recovery Program on Mondays from 7 p.m. until 8 p.m. Our Bible studies are held every Tuesday at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. You can also catch us, follow us, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Please come out and join us. Follow us. Follow our podcast. But most of all, get saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost. And always remember, walk in truth. And if you'd like to contact me by email, you can do so by going to walkintruthministries at yahoo.com or W-I-T-M-I-N at yahoo.com. Thank you and bless you. And we look forward to worshiping and fellowshipping with you. Peace.